In the third part of today's topic, I want to talk a little bit about the social construction of um, waste, try and make the normal look strange a little bit here, and again unpack some of the things that we take for granted in terms of their true costs. Um, so again, we think about, I've said a little bit already in the first part, you know, that waste is kind of seen, often seen as offensive, um, but it is largely invisible. The only kind of way we deal with it mostly is when we go and chuck stuff in our sulo bins and sometimes we recycle and all that kind of thing. We don't really deal with it after that and really it disappears out of our sight. And then, which you know means most of the time when anything disappears out of our sight, we stop caring about it. Increasingly, the developing world uses the, uh, is being used as a rubbish dump for the, for the developed world as well, which is obviously very um, ethically questionable. So when we're thinking about waste and, and value, we need to think about these very concepts as kind of socially cons constructed. They're, they're different between cultures um, and they're used in different ways, in different econ economic ways as well. So we can see, for instance, the way that waste is inbuilt into our, um, in our, to our consumer culture, particularly through those notions of planned obsolescence and perceived obsolescence. Again, the story of stuff um, unpacks that quite well. It shows that 99% of the things we buy is put in the trash within a year. This is completely normal. We don't even really think about it. In that sense, waste is seen as stuff that no longer has value. Um, but it's important to think about this in a kind of more make the normal look strange way where, you know, as Mary Douglas has pointed out, um, in terms of the context of rubbish, um, dirt is matter out of place. So when it's in the house, it's matter out of place and it's seen as being a problem. But when it's in the garden, it's in the right place. So here it's not necessarily about the actual thing, about whether it's wasteful or whether it's value. It's more about the economy of those things around that, the economy of values about who's making those judgments or the space that those things are in. So we need to change the way we consume in terms of our huge level of waste. Um, and we really need to start making this kind of stuff more public. Now what's interesting, I think, over the past decade, there's been more instances of pop culture kind of expressing this stuff. You know, there's shows on the ABC and stuff like that about it. The problem being that just awareness doesn't seem to be enough to make people actually change their practices. So that's kind of the, the key problem at the moment, that even though many people are aware of these things, um, there's, it's not seemed to be changing people's practices. And so many people would argue that, you know, it actually needs government intervention about this and things like, you know, it takes governments to actually ban the use of, say, plastic bags at um, supermarkets for the things that actually happen, leaving it up to the corporations, means it's unlikely for it to happen. Um, so interesting here, I think, a way of int uh, introducing new concepts of value was Raj Patel's work. Um, and he wants us to question the way that we attach value to things. So for instance, you know, he points out that water's really cheap, despite its importance and despite its often waning supply. Um, particularly in a country like Australia with huge problems with doubt, uh, sorry, drought and doubt, I suppose. Um, yet things like diamonds are really expensive, despite the fact they have virtually no use value. So there he's pointing very quickly to the notion of use value, doesn't really equate to how much things cost, and that's problematic. But he kind of takes these examples further. So many of us in 2010 will have watched the World Cup on SBS for free when it was on in South Africa. So we're watching that for free, we're sitting there enjoying it in our own homes, not costing us anything other than the TV that you bought and the electricity that's running the TV. But what that freeness um, kind of emits is the estimated two billion South Africa spent on hosting it. Um, and also, not just about building stadiums and stuff like that, the way that people were removed from their, home, ho their homes, slum clearance and all that kind of stuff. And they were move, often moved into areas with no jobs, no schools and no health facilities. So these social costs, the upheaval of you know, thousands of people, isn't born into the free thing that we're watching on television. Um, you can see this also too, if you think about it further, that we, when you sit there, you're watching it, you're bombarded with all these ads that you know, you don't, no one really wants to watch. So our so the social costs of these things, the social costs of watching lots of ads about McDonald's and Coke that seem to correlate to increases in obesity and things like that, um, are not included in the price. So the system that we live by depends on the real cost of things, the social costs being hidden, being externalised. So, you know, one, one, an example of this you may have come across particularly in first year sociology is kind of the Marxist analysis of domestic duties. 
Um, in 1995, it was estimated that if we actually paid um, or were paid for cleaning our houses and looking after children and all that kind of stuff, it'd be worth about $15 trillion. Um, as Patel points out, but because, as this seems to have largely been defined as women's work, it seems to be largely left out of the economy. An example, a more relevant example, I think, for our consumer culture course here is the idea that maybe a Big Mac really should cost $200 if you actually included all the externalities into it, the true cost of it would be much more. Um, so the carbon footprint um, of the 550 Big Macs a year is about 2.66 billion pounds of CO2, which has huge environmental uh, impacts, um, let alone the impacts of diabetes and obesity and heart disease. None of those things are in the drive through price. Um, the costs have to be paid by someone. So including those health costs, it'd be about 200 bucks a burger. But Patel goes a lot further than that. He starts bringing in things like subsidies and you know, food stamps and all this kind of stuff and, and the uh, effect on current practices on livestock in the future. He argues that therefore the burger would even cost even more. So again, this is a kind of a making the normal look strange here that Big, Mu Big Mac, how much it ever costs these days, um, should be probably 20 times the price. You can think about this in terms of the cost of petrol as well, and this is an American example. Um, in 2007 they were paying 92 cents a litre, that's probably a gallon, but anyway. Um, so if you actually included all the costs that Americans pay to keep the price of petrol at that price, estimated about $1.16 trillion every year in America, um, it should cost something like $2.64, you know, nearly three times the price of it. If you include it in the the military stuff, defending the Persian Gulf oils, the, the tax revenue and all that kind of stuff, and also cleaning up oil spills and related pollution. Now what's interesting there is if there was a kind of market thing going on, um, a true market, as many neoliberals believe, if the if the real cost was actually 264 or actually you know triple what we pay for it now, we might use it less. What's happening here is not actually a neoliberal market. It's being subsidised and propped up by military um, action um, and, and lots of other um, subsidies. So this is a kind of good example in particular, I think, of showing that those talk about leaving things up for the market don't really mean that quite often because they're often also involved in producing policies that um, are propping up various industries as well. So this all points to the politics of waste. And we can particularly hear the politics of waste, the kind of not in my backyard politics of waste, when it comes to where garbage needs to go or where a dump should go, particularly around things like medical and nuclear waste, you know, no one really wants to live next to that. Um, so this is a good example of that not in my backyard policy, uh, politics. And Beck, you know, Ehrlich Beck, the sociologist who talks about risk society, sees this as being kind of the key issues of politics today. We've moved beyond a kind of class politics of redistribution, and we're much more now interested in the politics of risk management, of you know where things should go and they shouldn't affect me. So this, I think, makes us kind of think a little bit more critically about our material culture. Um, waste is kind of embedded in the way that we do material culture, the way that we live it in our everyday life, but it's largely ignored. And this is kind of, I think one, one of the places I think that sociology could maybe make an impact in the real world if um, we can kind of get this knowledge out there more and more. I'm a bit dubious about the notion of awareness making changes, but it, I think over time it eventually does. Um, so hopefully, you know, we can um, make more contributions and get some of the kind of dominant economics that kind of, particularly the individualised and externalised versions of it um, changed. So this is a good way of thinking about that in terms of the, the choices, for instance. Now this is about climate change um, and a lot of the ways that kind of there's ideological arguments around this stuff. Um, it's kind of almost a little um, kind of thinking tool there. Like if we continue business of, as usual, if the scientists are right and we don't do anything, um, it could be the end of civilization. If they are right, um, if they're not right, well, we'll just kind of, you know, um, continue polluting anyway and the system will, uh, will continue as is and that's kind of horribly unethical. If we do make changes related to all the scientific knowledge that we have, you know, we'll kind of hopefully make it better for future generations. Um, and even if scientists are wrong about a lot of stuff, 
will still re reduce a lot of this waste and um, um, environmental destruction that will improve our lives anyway. So this is a kind of a way of kind of thinking, a new way of thinking, making that normal look strange. It probably needs to become more of the dominant way of thinking. So to include here, I'm just kind of linking into the next topic. Um, I'll be looking at the work of kind of Bauman uh, within the context of um, global inequalities in consumer um, cultures. Um, and Bauman talks about um, waste in terms of how many people's lives are wasted in this system, what he calls human waste, and he's being deliberately pro provocative there. Um, there's whole superfluous populations of migrants, refugees and outcasts, and he calls these people the collateral casualties of consumerism. And so this is what I'll be looking at in more detail in the next lecture. Thanks.